you find yourself picking up a pencil and just kind of sketching some of the things that are around you? Do you enjoy looking at buildings, architecture, and other things just for the details? Seeing the shadows, the colors, the values, the textures? Hi, I'm Barry Techmeyer, and I'm a watercolor artist here in Kansas City. And I am getting ready to teach the class Watercolor and Ink, Sketching in Line and Wash. Now you may be asking yourself, line and wash, what is that? Well, it's an urban sketching technique. It's a way that you can go out and you can take just a very little supplies with you and you can sketch some of the things that are around you. It's something I started about five years ago when I realized, you know, I don't have to get a drawing done and make it for a finished painting, but I can keep a sketchbook instead. So, stick around, join us, make sure that you have that sketchbook and pencil handy because we are about to embark on a creative adventure. This class is going to be appropriate whether you're new to urban sketching or even if you have experience. We're going to be experimenting with composition, using value, and various sketching techniques. We're going to explore using pen and ink and watercolor and try some new approaches to drawing and painting on location. We're going to start with an explanation of supplies that you might use when you go urban sketching. Next, we're going to be drawing with ink and some different techniques that you can use to create textures. Also, sketching your supplies is a very first sketch that we're going to be doing. Then, we'll be doing sketching a facade, whether it be a building or a house. And then finally, we are going to be looking at some great books on urban sketching. There are seven of them. Each one is different. Each one has some great ideas. And the last thing we're going to do is sketch a cityscape going to enjoy going down to downtown and drawing what we see. We've been using the term urban sketching a lot. Urban sketching basically means sketching on location. Urban sketches tend to focus on architecture or street scenes, but also include drawing people in cafes or in their daily commute or anything in between. As long as the sketch is done from life and outside the studio setting, then that can be considered an urban sketch. The supplies for urban sketching can be very simple. You can have something as simple as a sketchbook and a pen. But these are the supplies I normally use if I'm going to paint along with sketching. This is my drawing board. I like it a lot because it has the clip there on the right hand side and a large rubber band to hold down the sketchbook. And up there in the left hand corner are my containers for water. Notice there's two. One for clean water, one for dirty water. This is an Etcher sketchbook, E-T-C-H-R. And the sketchbook is really high quality. I like that the pages are nice and thick. I like that there's probably about 50 pages within this book. And I like that it's so durable that I can just throw it into my backpack and go wherever I want to. Any type of sketchbook will work as long as it has nice thick pages. Um, I would look to make sure that the pages are 100% cotton and probably that they are hot pressed, that it's smooth paper as opposed to really bumpy paper. Also look for the amount of pages that you have and just notice that I, I kind of like having the rubber band that holds the pages together. That's just a nice plus.
This is another type of sketchbook that I really like. This is a moleskin sketchbook. And they come in lots of different sizes, but this is probably the smallest that they make. I like this one because when I go on trips, I can put this in my pocket and just grab a pen and, and do some sketching that way. Um, I also like this one has the rubber band around the outside to, to keep it together. And also, um, it, the paper pages are thick enough that I can paint if I have the paint with me. This is my small plein air palette. I like this because it opens up pretty easily. And as you see when I open it up, it's got lots of room uh, for different colors. And there's plenty of mixing places as well. You'll notice there's also a place where you can put your finger in or put your thumb in and hold it on. So you can actually hold on to it and stand up and paint that way as well. One of the things I like about this most is that uh, after all the paints have dried and I can close it up. And this fits nicely into my backpack as well. If you're not wanting to deal with tube watercolors and you just want a set, then this Winsor Newton plein air set is a nice one to have. I like the size of it. This once again fits into my backpack pretty nicely. Comes with a small brush and also comes with a small container that you can put water in. Um, the one thing I don't like about it is I don't like how small the mixing trays are but they are functional and they do work. Um, and I have to make sure it's dried off really well before I close it up. Um, but that's the same with anything. Now I will tell you that um, there are many different types of paints out there that have pan sets that you can use. Um, Winsor Newton just seems to be one of the favorites that I have as far as uh, types of paint. For plein air work and for urban sketching work, you want some brushes that are easy to carry around. And this is a Fumui Travel Watercolor Brush Set. And these are just really, really nice. Uh, they're probably one of my favorite things that I have and I use. And um, these are made with scroll hair. And you'll notice that the handle screws off so they can become smaller. They make a really nice point on the end, so if I'm point painting with details, and this set comes with three different sizes. It comes with a large, a medium, small brush, uh, which is helpful when I'm doing painting out in, in open air. Um, and you can see all three of them fit inside this nice, really leather case. And um, I, just, I just find these really, really nicely to use. Now, do you have to have travel brushes? Absolutely not. You can just find a nice uh, watercolor brush you use, and you can keep in that backpack with you or whatever you're doing so that you can, you can paint. Um, but the travel brushes are just kind of a nice, nice thing to have um, because of the, their high quality. So. This is another nice thing to have uh, when you are out in plein air and you don't want to have to worry about dragging water around. These are water brushes. And with water brushes, they have a little cartridge on the top that comes off. You just fill it up with water and you can either use these to paint with um, you just squeeze the cartridge a little bit and the water comes out to the brush part and you can put that into your palette and get the paint out. Or some people like to mix up their own paint um, and put the paint inside the water container there and just paint with it that way. I've seen lots of creative people do different things with these. But And this is my mechanical pencil. And I do recommend getting a mechanical pencil if you're going to go out and do plein air work or urban sketching just because you do not have to worry about keeping it sharp. So you'll push the button on the end and uh, the lead comes on the other side. But this is what the lead looks like uh, when you have to refill it. It just comes in a little tube like that. And you just put this into the, mecha the mechanical pencil and fill up the lead. Uh, I think there's about three or four that will fit inside. Uh, that way, again, you don't have to worry about uh, running out of pencil. So if you're interested in doing some urban sketching work, this is the one thing I think that you should make as a purchase. These are Micron pens, and they come with archival ink, and they come with different tips, from a very thick tip uh, to a very, very thin 005. I absolutely love these. 
Uh, the great thing about them is you can draw with them and then paint on top of them and the ink is permanent so it does not mess up. This is my large set uh, that I keep in my backpack uh, so that when I'm sketching I'll have those too. I usually end up using the, the O5 more than any of the others. I do like the nice thick one though, however, if I have something that I am drawing that is a little bit bigger and I want to fill in with ink, uh, then I can do the O5. You can see that the tips on there are really nice and steady. They've got that metal piece around so they don't get smashed down. Um, but again, if you are going to be doing urban sketching, this is what you need to purchase. This is one of those nice to have that I just purchased this year. These are Lyra water soluble graphite sticks and they draw like pencils and you can color in with them really thick. But then after you do that, if you get a water brush and make sure you get one that has water in it first, you take that water brush and you brush over the top of it and it actually turns to paint which is just a fantastic neat thing to have you're going to need your sketchbook and your micron pen and with your micron pen, go ahead and draw five tree shapes, each one different, on a piece of your sketchbook paper. So now we're going to practice five different pen and ink techniques. The first one is called hatching. Hatching is when you use diagonal lines that are very close together, but they're not overlapping or touching. This creates a shadow. So on their tree, what you will need to do is just place it on one side of the trunk of the tree and also on the branches. You can do this fairly quickly, but the main thing is to make sure that those lines are not overlapping and that they're not touching. Be sure to leave on the other side a white space and that's going to emphasize the light hitting on the other side of the tree. The second technique is called cross contour. It's similar, except you're using curved lines that do not cross. What this does is it emphasizes the, the curvedness of the tree on the branches and also on the trunk. It can go all the way across the branches if you desire. It just depends on where you want that shading to be. This really emphasizes the 3D nature of the tree. Remember to keep the lines close together, but not overlapping, as you're drawing your cross contour lines. They're called cross contour lines because you're actually showing the contour of whatever you're putting the lines on. Go ahead and try to continue your lines down the bottom of the tree into the roots and also come up and do some of the branches sticking out. Now on the smaller branches you'll want that cross contour to go the opposite direction and you'll want them to be very very close together and go all the way across the branch. The next technique is called cross hatching. You're going to be using diagonal lines just like we did with hatching, but you notice the name is cross hatching. So you're going to be doing two different directions. You start out with one direction and then you're going to, with your pen, create lines that are going the opposite direction. These lines will intersect and they will overlap and that's what creates the shadows. Remember to focus on one side of the tree, like it's a shadow, and the other side of the tree will be where the light would be hitting it. But you'll probably start with one direction first, 
and then turn around and do your opposite direction. These can be diagonal as well, or they can be vertical. It totally depends on how you want it to appear, as long as you are cross hatching it. This is probably the technique that I use the most when I am drawing. It just creates a very nice looking shadow. With the micron pins, you can control the weight of the line with your pressure. So watch how hard you're pressing when you're doing the cross hatching. You want these to be lighter lines. Our next technique is probably the most sophisticated out of all of them. It is called fine cross hatching. Now it is exactly the same as cross hatching, except that you're using very, very light lines and you will probably cross hatch more than once. Uh, when I do drawings like this, I probably go over three or four times with hatching. And when you do this, it, it gives the, the, the illusion of a real tree or something that has been printed. So watch very carefully and make sure again that when you put them down first that the lines do not intersect. So you're doing a line of, of hatching first and then you'll do a line of cross hatching and then you'll do a third line which would be an, another line of hatching going a different direction. Once again, this needs to be very, very faint lines because these are called fine. And what you're doing is you're molding the shape of that tree using these hatch marks. The other thing about using fine cross hatching is you're able to create some nice textures as you're going across. Uh, sometimes in the middle of the tree uh, there might be some textures coming down or textures going across and it doesn't have to fill up the whole tree but it gives the tree more personality. Now you can see along the edge what I'm doing is creating the lines even closer so that that shadow is definite. When you're doing the fine cross contour, it really helps to have a resource photo so that you can see where the textures are, where the shadows are darker, and where they're lighter. For instance, when I'm drawing the lines that go across, uh, some of the lines uh, should go all the way across and some of them do not. And it just emphasizes how that texture uh, of the tree and the bark is kind of bumpy in that area. The final technique is called the basket weave and basically you're using groups of four lines and they're repeated going different directions. So I'm going to start here by doing four diagonal lines that are short. They're always the same distance. You try to make them the same. You're wanting this to look like it's a basket that's woven. Now we know that's impossible on a tree but it makes for an interesting texture on the side when you're doing your drawing.
you don't want two directions that are the same touching each other. So you could use the same directions repeating over and over again. You just don't want those lines to touch. Same thing, keep your lines the same distance apart and also try not to overlap. On this one, you do not want to overlap. The lines will touch, but you do not want them to overlap. So now you have five different techniques for creating texture and shading when you're using pen and ink. If there's one thing I can't have enough of, it's art supplies. So getting your supplies together and arranging them simply and start thinking about what shapes each one of these objects would be. As I'm laying the supplies out, I want to start making some observations. First of all, I want to look and see which of my supplies is the tallest. How close do I want them to be when I'm laying them out? How much space do I want in between them so that the shadows will show up pretty easily? What about the diameter of each one of the brushes or the pens? Are there some that are thicker? Which ones are shorter? Do I have them arranged the way I like them? Or do I want to have a more balanced approach? Do I want them all standing up nice and straight? Or do I prefer to have some of them just leaning down one to the other? What's going to be the best way for me to arrange these so I can start my drawing? I'm using my mechanical pencil and I'm starting out by just thinking basic shapes. The palette is two rectangles put together and the edges are rounded. However, for the water brush and the micron pen, I want them just to be kind of lines. For this part of the assignment, you need to start making some decisions with your ink pen in your hand. Your pencil will give you a basic idea but since I only want you to just do real basic lines on there with pencil first, then you can start making decisions about where that line would be in a finished drawing. One of the major objectives of this activity is for you to become comfortable taking that pen in your hand and drawing with it without pencil being underneath it.
Just as I mentioned earlier, look at how you compare the size of one object to the next. Also, when you're drawing something that's rounded, make sure that you're drawing a curved line on the top and not a flat line. Watch how part of the handles move in to get smaller and how they move out to get larger. Look at the clips on the side of the pin. If I'm going to break those down into some shapes, what shapes might they be? You have two longer lines, and on the very end, there's like a triangle. Also remember your spacing, because we are going to be adding shadows when we paint these. You don't have to be in a hurry. Take your time as you put down the pen on the paper and you're dragging it across the paper. Remember, this recording is sped up. So I did this much slower than what you're seeing. Look at each one of the sections on the paintbrush. Also remember about the curved lines going across to show the contour of the brush being rounded and not flat. Also the brush is the longest thing in this arrangement of art supplies. It helps to add some of the details that you're seeing. Right now on the Micron pens, I'm putting the logo because it was kind of a simple thing, but I'm not stressing over making it look exactly what the logo looks like. I'm simplifying it into a little star shape and then filling in the corners to make it dark. I'm using a series of lines to kind of represent the smaller words that are on the pens. But the micron is fairly large. So taking my pen, I'm going to draw and write the word micron in all capital letters, just like it's on the pen. Look at the different pens and see how some of them are turned just a little bit more so the words are going to be closer to the edge of the table than some of the others. very carefully at each one of the paints that are in the container, looking at the different size, looking at the different shapes. Again, one of the major objectives for doing this is for you to observe, to see how one object is different than the others based on the shape.
I'd like for you to use a water brush on this activity just because it's going to get you familiar with using that. I also keep a scrap piece of watercolor paper nearby. It helps me rinse out the brush easily, kind of wipe all the paint onto it so I can switch colors. I just took some of the paint that I had in the mixing trays and made a, a little bit of an area what looks like I've mixed up the color. The nice thing is that you can use that leftover paint that's in the mixing trays and I had one that was just perfect for the color of the Micron pens. Taking a little bit of blue and mixing it with that same color I was able to come up with a nice shadow. Again if you want to do the shadows in pen you can. I've known some people that have done this activity and they have used a water soluble pen so they would draw the lines and textures on there for the shadow and then use the water brush to blend it together and here is my finished sketch There's a historical district in Blue Springs, and there's some absolutely gorgeous houses. This one in particular, I've really been wanting to sketch. So creating this video gave me the opportunity to get in the parking lot across from the house and really spend some time looking at it. When you're doing a sketch, a facade of a house, the main thing is to look at shapes. Divide it up into basic shapes. If you'll notice, this is a triangle and some rectangles. But everything you're drawing, keep it simple. Don't be too detailed. You'll also notice I'm not using a pencil. I'm just using my pen and doing what the pen wants to. Sometimes the lines are a little bit crooked. But as we've talked about, that adds a little bit of character when you're urban sketching. This is the line part of the line and wash that I had mentioned earlier. Notice the windows. Sometimes windows have several lines around the outside of them, so you're basically drawing a shape inside a shape. Notice how many panes of glass there are on the top and how many there are on the bottom. And this porch was particularly interesting. One thing you might notice is that there was an iron fence in front of this house and I decided to leave it out because if I put it in then it would take away from seeing all the detail at the bottom of the house. The bottom part is made up of stone. So when you're doing stone or when you're doing the roof or anything that has a texture like this, just remember you're not showing a whole bunch of detail, but you're basically creating a pattern. And when you create a pattern, you don't have to fill it in completely. You're simplifying it as you're going along. Sometimes just placing the pattern here and there in the area that you're filling in. Not being afraid to leave white space. There's an interesting texture up on the gables. 
In order to create the texture, all I had to do was create two diagonal lines going different directions. I did the same thing on the roof, where again, it's a simple pattern, but it's not a complete pattern where I'm leaving spaces open. I just kind of drawing with a really rough line to create that texture. Drawing the lines on the side of the house. They're not, they're not straight, but once again, it gives the illusion of the texture that's there. I decided to go ahead and add a couple of the trees that were on the side of the house just because I had a big blank area on my paper. Again, I simplified these because they had a lot of bushes and there was a lot of different things in front. In order to simplify it, I just added the two bushes in front and just left the rest alone. So I got my sketch finished probably in about 20 minutes. And now I'm starting to put on the, the wash. Using my water brush and my paint, the triangle parts, or the gables, had purple in them, so I mixed that up. The roof was kind of a darker gray. And the side of the house was kind of a gray-green color, so I tried to mix that up as well. Once I put that on there, I realized that um, the roof isn't dark enough, so I need to go ahead and add some more gray to that. Building up the contrast. When you're doing line and wash, the color is just there to give the impression of what you're seeing. For the trees, I started out with a darker green and then added a regular kind of an emerald green on top, just so there was two colors mixing together, and I did it kind of in a wet and wet contrast. The sky was a bright blue, and there are several approaches that you can have to creating a sky. One approach is to use the negative space as the cloud. So leave the white of the paper white and then paint around it with the blue. Now I'm painting this wet on dry. The paper, I did not wet it down beforehand. And notice how I'm holding my brush. Holding my brush sideways allows me to kind of create an interesting flow to the clouds, to the bubble parts of the clouds. And in 30 minutes, my line and wash of the facade of the house is complete. I rated my library and chose seven really good urban sketching books. I want to start with this one. This is by Alfonso Dunn. He is a fantastic pen and ink artist, and the first book that he has is basically going over materials, the specifics. He will talk about some of the same things that I did earlier in this video. But the one thing I want to make sure that you see is all the different types of pens and pen and ink that you can have. So his first book is just called Pen and Ink Drawing, A Simple Guide, and then he has a workbook that goes along with it, which I really liked. And it gives you different things that you can do to become better utilizing the different techniques we talked about. So check, be sure to check this out. His illustrations all were done by Alfonso Dunn. And what I like to do is make a copy of uh, the, the pictures in the book and then do the work that way. And that way I'm not drawing directly into the book. But again, Pen and Ink Drawing Workbook by Alfonso Dunn.
Book number two, Sketch Now, Think Later. And this is by Mike Yoshiaki Daikabara. I probably just demolished his, his last name. Sketch Now, Think Later basically is an instructional book about how to do urban sketching. Once again, it goes through some of the basics, talking about the different materials, and also talks about how to do urban sketching. He has some wonderful ideas. Very simplified book. It's, you know, it's very easy to read. Uh, the illustrations are done very well. He also talks about what not to do because there are some things that people have done for many years that when you're doing urban sketching, it's really not that necessary to do. So check it out. Sketch now, think later. Book number three is called Five Minute Sketching Architecture by Liz Steele. This book is a little bit more detailed and it talks specifically about architecture and buildings. It gives you step-by-step -step instructions on how you would draw a building if it were a little bit more complicated. This one does not talk about materials or supplies. This is probably for somebody that has been doing urban sketching for a while. I was attracted to this book the first time I saw it just through the photographs and the illustrations. The illustrations pretty much explain it step by step most of the time. But I do recommend this one as well for somebody that's been sketching for a while. Five minute sketching architecture. Next, it's just called the Urban Sketcher. And this is Specific Techniques for Drawing on Location. This is by Mark Tyra Holmes. Most of these books, the illustrations, were done by the author of the book. So not only were they uh, written, uh, and they, they're the ones that, are, that do all these techniques, they're the ones that did the illustrations as well. Three-pass sketching is, is a really good technique that I've tried to utilize where you come in first time with a real basic outline, and then the second time you're getting more specific into the details that are there, and the third time you're doing it, you are finishing it up. And he utilizes that through this entire book. Once again, when you're looking at this book, you cannot note but say that the illustrations are just fantastic. So this is The Urban Sketcher by Mark Taro Holmes. The next two books are by the same author. This is The Urban Sketching Handbook, 101 Sketching Tips. Now what I like about this book by Stephanie Bauer, it is a compilation of 101 sketching tips from a whole bunch of different urban sketchers. One of the best things to do when you're looking at a book is to see how many tips, how many ideas, how many ways that the author gives you that you can utilize right away. And I would say that that is the truth with this one. If there's one book that you're going to be getting out of all the ones I'm going to show you, this is the book to get. It's great for beginners. It goes over perspective. It goes over how to draw buildings again. It has lots and lots of great ideas given to you by people that are out there doing urban sketching. So the Urban Sketching Handbook, 101 Sketching Tips. And here is the second book by Stephanie Bauer. It is The World of Urban Sketching. This book I got on Amazon, and I got this book because actually one of my friends is in this book. This shows you urban sketchers from all over the world, and including Kansas City, Missouri. Mark Anderson, uh, who happens to be a good friend of mine, is in the book as one of the sketchers. And the same thing as a smaller book. This gives you tips. It shows some of their artwork. They talk about some of the things that they did, one of the things they like, their techniques. It's just really a wonderfully done book. It's so full of stuff. And I like it because it's every time I pick it up, I see something new. 
So I would recommend getting you one of these seven books. And either this one or the other one by Stephanie Bauer would be my choice. Main Street in Blue Springs. And on the corner, there was a building that had a lot of character. I really liked the awnings, as well as the windows above, and the perspective on the side. Some great things to include when I'm doing my sketches. When you're looking for a building to sketch, make sure you find one that has a lot of fascinating details. We could actually call this technique wash and line because we're going to start out with a very very loose wash using brighter colors when i was observing that building i noticed a lot of oranges and reds and blues as i'm starting to paint first of all i have my paper tilted up so that the paint drips down and i'm just basically going for some rectangles the main shapes I'm seeing there, but I am not going to be picky about getting the color in the right place. I am going to start by using some lighter colors and then going towards some darker colors. I am also going to try and get the main part of the building painted and then go up and add uh, some possible places where the windows might be and maybe the doors but I'm not going to worry about if they're not shaped exactly like what I see. I just kind of want a shaded area that I can come around with uh, my ink and show that window. It's going to be creating an underpainting. That underpainting creates a beautiful color that I can then take and draw on top of with my pen and ink. I also want to show you what my studio looks like in the inside of my car. With my GoPro camera there in front, I don't have very much room to work, uh, but it was a lot of fun to sit there and, and paint uh, inside the car while it was raining. I let it dry for a little while, uh, probably about 10 minutes before I went ahead and started using my ink. Once again, the line is the most important part and also looking for those characteristics that are going to really make this pop. For instance, the window that's above the door, the fanlight window that's above the door, and also the curve on the top of the windows, the frieze that's on top of the building, the pole that's next to the building. One thing I do not want you to do when you're doing this activity is to get out your pencil and start drawing with pencil first. Be observant. Draw your lines carefully. Remember that this video is sped up so that it doesn't take quite so long to watch. But go slowly. Look at those characteristics of the building and see what you can add. Here is another specific thing that I want to make sure. This is a sign that's no longer there, but it comes out in perspective because when I was looking at it, it kind of stuck out to one edge. And again, it just adds some interest. This building had some interesting brickwork on the side. I didn't want to go ahead and, and put all the details from that brick in but I was able to put in a pattern to simplify it. Now I'm coming in with the awning. There are actually awnings over some of the other windows as well, but I wanted to keep it simple and make sure that this one was the one that people saw first.
One thing that helps you when you're drawing with ink is you'll make a dot on the paper where you want to draw the line to. And so you can keep that line straighter by drawing in between the dots. Look for patterns. Look for similarities and things that are around each other. And this is how much I got done uh, before it started pouring down rain and I had to take uh, everything back to my house and finish it in my studio. Once again, looking at some of the same things, I'm looking at the photograph to finish it up. And you can see how the color, um, it just, it just kind of makes a nice undertone to the ink that's on top. Look at how that white contrasts with the red and the white does not show where that window is. Be careful about sidewalks. Sometimes when people draw sidewalks, they draw them so that they look like they're on the side instead of very, very flat and in perspective. In this situation, you don't see very much of the sidewalk. That little porch that's on the corner there, however, I had to look at it very, very carefully to get it just like I wanted it for the corner. If there is a section that you're having a hard time drawing, get you a pencil out and sketch it in a sketchbook first or on a specific piece of paper, and that way you can get it a little bit better than just drawing it uh, straight with ink. Coming in with bricks, watch the size of them and also watch how many you're putting in. The idea here is also just to give the impression that there are bricks on the side of this and that whole thing is bricked. There was some writing on the side of the windows and I just very very lightly came in and did some of that just to show it was there. And this is the finished piece. So I hope this class challenged you with some new ideas for when you go out and go sketching. Now I've got four questions for you to review what we've just talked about. Question number one, what does line in line and wash mean? Question number two, what is urban sketching? Question number three, what is the difference between hatching and fine cross hatching? Question number four, why are micron pens a good investment when doing urban sketching? I hope that you're able to answer the questions. And now what I want you to do is get out your sketchbook and start sketching.